is the praise and worship that entertains God, Amen. that goes up as a sweet savor to God. Amen. That is the kind of praise and worship that God wants to hear, Amen. wants to inhabit. Amen? Amen. 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 You may all be seated if you're going to help me preach today. I had, for probably about three weeks, I had a message in mind. I was going to be talking about sacrifice and how we need to be living sacrifices. And I was, I was pumped for it. I was excited for it. And nothing was really fitting together. And how many people have ever prayed, God, if it's not your will, shut the door. If it is your will, open the door. <clears throat> right? Yeah. Nothing was working together. Nothing was quite coming together right. There was lots of really cool stuff. I was excited about, about Mount Moriah specifically. There was some cool stuff that was going to be coming together. I know it's pretty funny, right? <laughs> and yesterday was the final nail in the coffin, if you will. I opened up, because I use technology, I opened up, and half of the stuff that I had written down had been deleted. And I'm like, well, God, I'm going to take this as you're shutting the door. Clearly, this is not what you want me to speak. So what do you want me to speak? And I felt that God responds to faith. So we're going in a completely different direction than I had intended. But I think it's good. I always trust God, even when I don't understand what's going on. God responds to faith. When God had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, he brings them out into the wilderness. And Moses goes up on top of the mountain, and he's talking with God. Given God or given Moses all the plans, everything that they need to do, you got to make sure you're doing this. This is how you're going to sacrifice. This is what kind of sacrifice you're going to do. Here are the Ten Commandments. And everything's getting wrapped up. And God says to Moses, Hey, your people are starting to rebel. Yeah. Exodus, what do I got? 32. If you would be so kind, Mr. Matt. The Lord said to Moses, Go down. For your people whom you brought out of, out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it. God had just delivered them out of Israel, or out of Egypt. God had just delivered them. And they turn around and start worshipping a false god. They start worshipping this golden calf that they made themselves. And God wasn't having it. God wasn't having it. Next verse. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, they are a stiff-necked people. Or in other words, man, they are stubborn. They are stubborn. And I'm not dealing with it anymore. Therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I make a great nation out of you. Now pause there. This is not too long after God had destroyed the earth with a flood. Yeah. Now God made a promise that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. Yeah. That he would not just take it, the whole earth and destroy it. But we're talking about a nation God is saying, I'm sick of it. This people are too stubborn. I'm not dealing with it. I'm going to wipe them all out right now. Moses, we're starting over with you. Yeah. I fully intend God planned on doing that. Or I fully believe God intended to do that. I have no doubt in my mind God was ready. He had the kindling going. The fires were started. He was getting ready, winding back. And Moses steps in. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt? 
And I'm going to go into the Nate revised version a little bit, Matt, so if you can keep up. Why should the Egyptians say, man, their God brought them out of Egypt just to destroy them in the wilderness? What are, what are, what, why, why are you doing this? Turn from your burning anger. Relent from your, this disaster against your people, Lord. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Remember them. You promised them to bring them into a promised land, that their, their, their children would be this great nation. And the Lord, verse 14, relented from the disaster that he had spoken that he was going to bring on his people. You have got the king of kings. You have got the God who made heaven and earth, that made the very earth that Moses was standing on. The God who knows what the last digit of pi is. The God who made time itself. The God who is all-powerful, all-knowing. And Moses is saying, Lord, you should change your mind. God, what are you thinking? You should change your mind. God had spoken. This was how it was going to be. And Moses said, Lord, let's reconsider. And God listened. God responded. God responded to that. You, you want to know what the biggest fall in humanity is? The biggest downfall, in my opinion, of humanity is that we don't ask God for something. We don't go to God first. We ask Anybody else. We ask everybody else. And when it's our last available option, we come to God and we say, God, can you fix this? Lord, I've tried everything else. You're my last resort. And God is sitting there holding on to the miracle saying, I've been waiting for you to come. It's been 20 years, Nate. What have you been doing? I think that's our biggest fall. That's our biggest fail as humanity. Well, this, this just must be the way it is. This just must be the way it is. I just have to accept it. It's just part of who I am. I just have to accept it. No, 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 friend. Why would you settle for anything less than what God has for you? Amen. Why would you settle for anything less than what God has promised you? Amen. The book of Genesis, chapter 18, I've got it in there, but I'm just going to kind of run through it because it's a lot of scriptures. Abraham and God are talking. Abraham and God, God says, hey, you know that wicked city, Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm kind of sick of them. They're, they're a stain on the earth. There's so much sin, it's disgusting. I'm wiping them off the face of the earth. And Abraham says, Lord... If there are 50 people in that city, if there are 50 righteous people who are right living and not partaking in sin, would you spare the whole city? And God says, yes. If I find 50 righteous, right living people, I will spare the city. And Abraham says, well, Lord, would you do it for 45? And God says, yes, I'd do it for 45. What about 40, Lord? Yeah, yeah, Abraham, I'll do it for 40. If there are 40 righteous people, what about 30? Yes, Abraham, if there are 30 righteous people, then I will spare the city. Okay, God, hear me out. What about 20? What about 20, Lord? God says, yes. If there are 20 righteous people living within Sodom and Gomorrah, then I will spare the city because of those 20 people. And Abraham says, Lord, I know I'm just dust here. 
I know that I have no right to ask this of you, but what about 10? If there are 10 people living righteously, would you spare the city? And God says, yes, for 10. And Abraham says, okay, cool. God goes and looks and does not find 10 people. There was Lot and his family living inside the cities. And I cannot speak to say whether Lot and his whole family were living for God. I really, I don't know. I would like to say his daughters and the ones that have been married and everybody was living at least a righteous life, at least trying to. So who knows? Maybe there were nine righteous people living in that city. Maybe there was one righteous person living in that city. I'm not God. I don't know. But Abraham stopped at 10. And because Abraham stopped at 10, the whole city got destroyed because there was not 10 righteous people living in the cities. Do not stop asking when things are good enough. Don't stop asking when things are, you know, just good enough. The man that Jesus prayed for, I don't have the scripture in mind. The man that Jesus prayed for that was blind, prayed for him and said, okay, what do you see? And the man says, I see people walking around like trees. And I don't know what that looks like. Maybe one day I'll find out. I don't know what that looks like. It's kind of, kind of a weird statement. I see men walking around as trees. And Jesus said, well, that's not right. And prayed for him again. But what if that man had said, no, you know what? This is so much better than what it was. This is so much better than what it was. You can stop here, Lord. I can see it's not right. It's not all that you want to give me, but it's good enough. Don't stop asking for God to move when things are just good enough. You see, the thief comes, John 10 and 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. What does that mean? What does having life abundantly mean? Does it mean that everything is going to be perfect? You go down in Jesus' name, get baptized, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, everything is perfect from then on? No. It means that we can go to God, say, Lord, I'm dealing with this problem right here. I have no way to fix this. I could spend thousands of dollars trying to fix this. I could spend years of my life trying to fix this. But Lord, I know you're able to fix this. I know you are more than capable of taking care of this. Life more abundantly means that we have a problem solver in our corner. Whenever we got a problem, we come up and say, Lord, I need some help here. It's just like a little kid with a toy. It's just like a little kid with a toy. Now, we know this toy runs off of AA batteries. And that it makes a lot of noise. And this little kid playing with it and all of a sudden it stops moving. It's no longer making the noise. The little kid doesn't understand it needs new batteries. All it understands is my toy is broken and I need some help. So what are they going to do? They're going to go to mom and dad and say, mom, dad, my toy is broken. My toy needs fixed. Mom and dad, knowing that they're going to finally get a good night's rest, might elect to say, oh no, bummer. But God, when we come to him and say, God, I have this problem. Lord, I have no idea what I'm going to do. God is able to say, okay, that's easy. That's no problem. Let me take care of that right now. And boom. Life more abundant means that we have a problem solver in our corner. For every problem that we have, God has a solution. Amen? All we got to do is ask. All we got to do is ask. God for when I'm sick or when I'm feeling well. 
I have a God who puts my enemies beneath my feet. I have a God for when I'm sick or when I'm feeling well. I have a God, I have a God, and my God cannot fail. I have a God. Dan, Mary, it is so good to have you here. Can we give him, give them a new life welcome? First time you guys are visitors, sec any time after that, come right in and just worship right with us. You guys were worshiping beautifully this morning. Now, I kind of did things out of or order there. But I love each and every one of you. And this is why I did it out of order. I love each and every one of you. It is so good to see you every Sunday, every Wednesday. I love, I love you guys. But don't take this the wrong way. I'm not coming to this church to see you guys. It is encouraging to me. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear me wrong. It is encouraging to me. But I don't come to be, be you know, check off who's here today. I don't come to be able to say, well, I got to shake so-and-so's hand. I'm feeling good today. I come here because we all have one thing in common. We all have one thing in common. We're coming here to get closer to God. Amen. We're coming here because we know that there is a God in heaven that loves each and every one of us, that cares about each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Can you, can you fathom that? God is able to do above what we ask and what we think. Has anybody ever gone to try and buy something and you have to barter? You're thinking to yourself, 220. I could do 220, but... I know if I start with 220, I'm not going to get it for 220. So I'm going to start with 190. Yeah. What you ask and what you think are two different things. And maybe that's a goofy example. But how many times do we come to God with that same mentality? Well, God, it'd be great if you could do this. But I'm going to ask for this. This might be a little too hard for you, Lord, so I'm just going to ask for... Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. God is able to do above all that we ask or think. God can take care of any situation, no matter what it is. He made this earth. He has full control over this earth. So I have no right to put limitations on my God. Amen? Matthew 28... And let's skip to verse 18. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We serve a God that has all power in heaven and in earth. We serve a God that is more than able to take care of what we need. Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other... For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus has all power. The name of Jesus has all power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. All that we have to do, Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is a problem solver and all we have to do is ask. All we have to do is come boldly Amen. to the throne of grace and say, God, I need your help right now. God, I don't know what I'm going to do with it if I don't get your help. Amen. All we have to do is ask. Amen? 
Because God responds to faith. God responds when someone asks. Mark chapter 10 and verse 46. Jesus is down on earth. He came to Jericho, and when he was on his way out of Jericho with his disciples, there was a great number of people. And blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And they, next verse. And when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was walking by, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus! Verse 48. And everybody that was around was saying, hey man, don't you know God is too busy for you? Don't you know that he's got things to do? He's already walked by you. If he was going to heal you, he would have come over and healed you, buddy. He's already going, so you need to cut, you need to cut it out. Shut your mouth. You're kind of making it uncomfortable for the rest of us here. You're making this a little more uncomfortable than it should be. And he cried out even louder. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus, verse 49, Jesus stood still. And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man. And this is something I never noticed until today. I always was figuring, they're walking down the road. There's like ten people with him. Right? It says that Jesus stood still. And he told them to bring him over. Or in other words, he's walking. And somebody way over there is crying out, Jesus! Have mercy on me. And he says, go get him. We're not leaving this spot. Go get him. And the whole crowd that was around Jesus, because everybody wants to see Jesus do something, so they're following him. They're going with him. They want to see the miracles. They want to hear the teachings. And so they're passing the message along. Hey, go, go tell him. Tell him to get over here. Get him over here. Get him over here. And it's going and it's going and it's going. And finally, it gets to him and they're like, well, you're in luck. He's calling you up there. Be of good comfort. Rise, because he's calling for you. Verse 50 says he took off his garments, or in other words, his beggar's garments. There's a whole message in that. (laughs) Took off his beggar's garments, rose and came to Jesus. Started walking to Jesus. And he gets there, and Jesus said unto him, what do you need me to do? God is not going to push himself upon you. God did not come up there, you know, uh, Bartimaeus didn't come up there, and Jesus just go, boom, you can see. He says, all right, what do you need? Now, we might think that's kind of goofy, but it's because God is a gentleman. So all we have to do is ask. Jesus says, what do you need? And Bartimaeus says, I'd like to be able to see. I would like to be able to see. Verse 52. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Or in other words, Completely healed. Completely taken care of. The whole problem was no longer an issue. And he was made whole. He was made completely, 100% healed. He received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. When you are in need of a miracle... When you are in need of an answer from God, don't keep quiet. Lord, 
It's your humble servant here. I pray that you help me today. I pray that you help me out. When you need something from God, don't keep quiet. Lord, help me out here. Lord, have mercy on me. How many miracles went unfinished because someone was unwilling to ask? How many miracles have gone unfinished because someone was too scared or too worried or too afraid to just say, God, have mercy on me? Luke chapter 17. Jesus again on his way to Jerusalem. He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance according to the law. And they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go, your, well, or go and show yourselves to the priests. That was according to Levitical law, which they were still under. Go show yourselves to the priests, because the priests would look at that leprosy and would see if it was still there or not. And it was very obvious whether or not it was there, because, if, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but it would be like a white, disgusting dry up your fingers, dry up your toes, dry up your nose, your ears, and it would eat away and kill your skin and just slowly eat its way. And so you could lose fingers, you could lose hands, you could lose your arm. Wherever it went, it would just slowly eat off and kill everything with it. And so the priests would look and examine their entire bodies and figure out, okay, you are clean from any leprosy, or they would say, sorry, bud, it's looking better, but you're not clean yet. And so, Jesus is telling them, you need to follow Levitical law, go see the priests. And as they were going there, they were cleansed. Or in other words, they were healed. Yeah. So the people who had had their fingers eaten away, the people who had had their nose eaten away and their ears, they were walking along and they start looking down. And they start seeing, hey, this looks like flesh again. This is no longer eaten away my skin. It looks like flesh. I have been healed. Yeah. Can you imagine that? How long they had been living with it. How long they had been living with it. And they weren't afraid to say, God, have mercy on us. And Jesus says, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were healed. Can you imagine the praise? Yeah. Can you imagine the excitement yeah. that they were feeling? The, the overall joy. I'm going to be able to go home. I can go back into the city. Yeah. Yeah. And one man was so overjoyed that he turns around. And he goes back to Jesus, praising God. Yeah. Praising God. And when he gets to Jesus falls down before him and thanks Jesus. What verse am I in, Matt? I started jumping around. <laughs> falls down. Verse 15, verse 16, fell at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, and this man was a Samaritan. Verse 17, and Jesus said, hang on a second, weren't there 10 of you? Weren't there 10 of you? that were cleansed, where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? All right, so be it. He said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Or in other words, completely cleaned, completely healed. Everything that that leprosy had taken away God restored right then and there. Every finger, every toe, every bit of skin that he had lost due to leprosy, completely healed right then and there. Your faith has made you well. 
God responds to faith. Why does God respond to faith? Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anybody that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you need to have faith to be able to come to God and you need to have faith to be able to say, God, I know you can take care of this problem. God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Yeah. Romans 10 and 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which is what we're doing today. Matthew 21 and 22. Whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing or having faith, you shall receive. Amen. So I want you to think back. How many of your prayers have been answered? How many of your prayers have been answered? Matt, how quick are you with your fingers? I need, I need a scripture. Revelations 12, 11, if you would be so kind, sir. How many of your prayers have been answered? Because those answered prayers become testimonies. And those testimonies bring faith to other people. Somebody's going through something rough, you can say, I got, I got a testimony to share with you. Because they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Yep, yep. By the word of their testimony. Sister Joan, how many prayers has God answered for you? About 99 and a half. 99 and a half. <laughs> how many prayers has God answered for you? I asked Sister Borkature before service. She has got testimonies galore. Yep. I only know a few of them and I need to know more. She was trying to sell her house years ago, and it was not a seller's market. It was not going to be very good, and she's praying, I need this amount, I need this to happen, and she prayed that nobody else except the buyers would come into the house. Yep. You'll have to ask her the reason why. I encourage you, go ask her. <laughs> I encourage you, you want to hear this testimony. Anyway, somebody pulls up, and knocks on the door for the open house, and Sister Borkature's inviting them in, saying, come on in, come take a look. And they say, no, you know, that's okay, that's all right, no thanks, and leaves. <laughs> the only person that entered the house was the buyer, and they were able to sell that house. Ask her about the paring knife. Ask her about the testimonies. Sister Gina, or as I better know her, Mom. How many prayers has God answered for you? How many prayers has God answered for you? How many of your children are supposed to be in the grave if it wasn't for God? How many of your children weren't even supposed to get out of the womb if it wasn't for prayer? I know in my own life, I stood right here getting prayed for. My dad had just passed away from something. I, to this day, I do not know what it is. Doctors were baffled by it, and he couldn't feel his legs, he couldn't walk. It was, it was going downhill really fast for him. And he passed away, no answer, no idea. Do I have that? Do my siblings have that? It freaked me out. And so I spent two weeks with something going on, something going wrong inside of my body. I could not work. I could not play. I could not, I mean, I was sleeping 15, 20 hours a day which is not normal for a 25-year-old. And so I'm trying to figure this out, and the whole time my mind is thinking, is this what was going on with Dad? Is this what was going on? And so it came to that I'm thinking to myself, I need to figure out what this is. Even if it messes me up for the rest of my life, I need to know what it is so that my siblings don't have to deal with this, that we can get a name for it. I was so, I was so specific. I was praying, God, let me know what the name of this is so that we can treat it. 
so that my siblings don't have to go through this. And I stood right here being prayed for. Bishop Fez was praying for me. Pastor Pinon was praying for me. And I know others were. And I'm praying to God. And God starts healing me. I feel the anointing oil hit my head and start going down my shoulders. And I know that I'm about to be healed. And I say, God, hang on a second. I don't know what the name of this is yet. I don't know. What if my siblings have it? We need to know what this is. And God says, oh, you don't want to be healed? Talk about a mistake. I had to spend another two weeks, a month in total, not able to work. And the next time, I was getting prayed for. I wasn't even in the altar. I had just turned around, was sitting in my chair at, I don't remember which church it was. And so one of my buddies comes over and starts praying for me. And I start feeling that anointing oil again. And I don't know if it was me or if it was God. But it was something along the lines of, do you still want to know the name or are you done with this? <laughs> and I said, God, heal me. You are the miracle worker. You are the problem solver. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I need a healing. Amen. So I want to do something here this morning. I want to do something here this morning. I want every single person, if you have a need in your life, I want you to stand. It doesn't matter how big, how small, it doesn't matter. I would like this to happen in my life. I would like something. It could be something major. My mom is in the hospital. It doesn't matter what it is. God is here to answer your prayers. What we're going to do is we're going to pray together. If we could lift our hands and let's talk to God. God Almighty, I believe that you are a prayer answering God. Lord, I have faith that you are more than able, more than capable to do above all that I ask or think. Lord, I pray that you will touch my body, touch my heart, touch my mind, move over my situation, Lord God. Help me, Jesus, to be able to get closer to you and, and take care of this situation. Lord, I pray that you touch every single person in this place. Let faith arise, Lord, and help us to not be afraid to ask. Help us to not be afraid to ask. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Lord God. Lord God.